Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, today, I want to give you a brief tutorial. And uh, because this is sort of a shortened version of an actual three hour tutorial, which thank you so much, um, could, um, could really be um, five hours long because deep learning is a, is a very uh, you know, fast growing area. And uh, you could almost guarantee that uh, once you finish preparing the slides, they're already outdated uh, because there are a lot of very exciting things happening right now. So uh, today, since we'll have only about an hour, maybe a little less because I don't want to let you wait um, too long for lunch, um, I will focus only on a couple of important new um, developments uh, that are largely uh, giving rise to this little modifier here, which is recursive deep learning for natural language processing. And no worries, I will define what is being recursive here, what does deep learning mean, and so on. But before I go there, let me start first by saying that in general, in natural language processing, we're very good and we have lots of different algorithms to represent and label single words. So if we have here, for instance, the sentence Richard lived in Ethiopia for a while, we're, we have very accurate algorithms to give us the so-called part of speech tags that you know, tell us Richard is a proper noun phrase, lived is a verb phrase, uh, a verb uh, this is a proper noun, this is a preposition, and so on. Uh, we also have uh, very accurate so-called named entity recognition algorithms that give us the dis discrete label of saying, all right, Richard is a person, Ethiopia is a location, and so on. However, when we just classify words into these discrete single categories, um, that we lose a lot of information. There's no sense of, uh, you know, that certain words are synonymous, so we have no idea that loquacious and talkative, for instance, are very similar in meaning. And so another representation that has become more and more popular in the last couple of years is to represent words in terms of continuous vectors, so just lists of numbers. And uh, in these kinds of continuous vector representations, we can also capture that there are certain parts of speech tags. So I will zoom in in a second, and generally these uh, vectors are around 50 to 100 dimensional. Um, I will just illustrate them here in two dimensions project them down into a two-dimensional space to show you what is being captured in this larger dimensional space and uh, to visualize and illustrate the models. So when we zoom in to, for instance, the noun cluster um, of these word vectors, then we will see that they're not just capturing syntactic information to part of speech tags, but also captured semantic information. So for instance, the vector for France and Germany is very similar. And uh, the main way we compute these vectors is in terms of distributional uh, um, similarities. So for instance, uh, what that means is basically we keep counts of how often a word appears in the context with other words. So we would assume, for instance, that France and Germany might both appear very often in sentences that also have European Union and Central Europe and things, words like that in them. And because they have similar kinds of distributions in terms of which words they co-occur with, they will get similar vector representations in these models. There are tons of different models out there. The simplest one are based on uh, straightforward uh, principal component analysis, for example. And there are other deep learning methods also that compute these vectors as well. Um, here, you know, we see again other parts of the noun cluster. Uh, minister, leader, president, chairman also get similar vectors. So we're, we're seeing that we're capturing not just discrete syntactic information, but also finer grain semantic similarity. But what about larger text units? Um, for instance, if we have the two sentences here, two senators received contributions engineered by lobbyist Jake Abramoff in return for political favors, and Jake Abramoff attempted to bribe two legislators. We as people have a very good idea that these two sentences are very similar in meaning. But it's very hard to capture that with most of existing technology right now. And what I'm arguing is basically that people interpret the meaning of larger text units, be it you know, entities like Bank of China, which has some compositional structure, descriptive terms, facts, arguments, or even entire stories in terms of semantic composition of the smaller elements. So let's take a look at a couple of ways that traditional natural language processing has dealt with this problem of representing longer phrases or, yeah, and, and you know, long sentences. The most common way of representing larger text units is in terms of a simple bag of words. 
uh, which is essentially just a count vector uh, that is, has the size of the vocabulary and ignores word order entirely. So for instance, uh, if we have here the phrase white blood cells destroying an infection, you know, maybe we're in the medical domain, we want to analyze uh, what the sentiment is um, in, in your own pathology report, then the representation uh, for this, the bag of words representation, would just be a very long, very sparse vector that is the size of the vocabulary, maybe 100,000 words, and it just it has one where, you know, for the words that actually appear in this uh, phrase. This can work reasonably well if you just try to do information retrieval or topic modeling or just want to identify this, you know, document about medicine or sports or politics and things like that. But you quickly run into problems when you actually want to get a finer grained understanding of each phrase and sentence. So if we have, for instance, an infection destroying white blood cells, then it turns out that you know, if one is in your pathology report, you'd be pretty happy. If the other one is, you, you might be in big trouble, but they have exactly the same bag of words representation. So bag of words models have no way of distinguishing the two. Um, there are other examples. This one comes from a, a sentiment analysis problem where it says this film doesn't care about cleverness, wit, or any other kind of intelligent humor. A lot of sentiment algorithms start with this kind of representation and just kind of count positive words, subtract, you know, weights for negative words, and then come up with a final description of, you know, is this positive or negative. And here, you know, you can see there's basically no negative words, and we got, you know, humor, intelligent, kind, wit, cleverness, care, without understanding the structure of the sentence, the grammatical structure of the sentence, and realizing that doesn't actually has a scope over the entire rest of the sentence, there's no way you could really understand that this is negative, even though it's very obvious for people. And at the very end of the talk, I will show you what uh, the newest deep learning techniques can actually do to correctly uh, classify the sentence as being negative. All right, so bag of words are problematic. Um, another solution to deal with longer phrases is to just look at fixed windows one at a time. So if we wanted, for instance, we had a sentence here and we wanted to just classify that the center word is a noun phrase or a noun. Um, then what we would do is basically, you know, we could just look at the two words to the left and if this is a determiner like the or an adjective like beautiful, then, you know, it would be quite, you know, high probability that the center word would be um, a noun. So these window-based approaches work reasonably well for part of speech tagging and for named entity recognition, the two problems I showed in the first slide, and also for phoneme classification in speech, where you just want to classify for a fixed window of sound, is this, you know, b, uh, z, or, you know, other kinds of phonemes. This is actually this kind of architecture um, with multiple layers here is one that is being used in every speech recognition system, every state-of-the-art speech recognition system nowadays. Uh, based on neural networks. Um, however, this is a, also a very simplified assumption, right? You're basically assuming that if I wanted to understand a certain word here, I don't care at all about what's, you know, three words to the left or five words to the right. I only care about the two left words or the two right words. And so we quickly run into trouble here, and this is another example from a sentiment uh, data set that we've worked on um, that shows you sort of how this uh, window-based approach can run into trouble. So the sentence is, if you enjoy being rewarded, so you might say that's a positive window. By script, it assumes. It turns out talking about scripts is usually a good thing also in movie reviews. You aren't very bright. So now you realize the rest of the sentence is actually quite negative, um, or this window is negative, and you would want to have some way that automatically learns that together when I combine these, this becomes a negative uh, sentence. And once you see the movie title, you realize, all right, this is probably not a high quality movie. So that uh, was the second way um, you could deal with variable sized uh, natural language input. The third one is to just represent basically phrases in terms of discrete, rep with discrete representations, which, uh, for instance, in the uh, case of formal logic um, and, and sort of semantic parsing, uh, was, would result in, in the following kind of discrete logical uh, proposition here with Mary, Mary likes Sue, we would just say likes M, S. And M would be, you know, the token for Mary and liking is just a discrete uh, 
token. And so there's no notion of semantic similarity of Mary maybe loving Sue or disliking Sue or enjoying to hang out with Sue. There's no notion of similarity if you just have this discrete representation. And that is also true for a lot of uh, different syntactic parsers, so uh, models that try to understand the grammatical structure of sentences where you, you know, would just say a cat is just a noun phrase and there's no relationship to other kinds of noun phrases that might be very similar, like my fluffy cat or you know, my nice pet and, and my you know, friendly dog and whatnot. So uh, the proposal that deep learning uh, has put forward is to, instead of representing um, phrases as these discrete categories or making, uh, you know, oversimplifying uh, independence assumptions, couldn't we combine the ideas of word vectors that capture syntactic and semantic information latently in you know, 50 to 100 dimensions and uh, actually extend the ideas of discrete representations of longer phrases and combine these ideas and basically say, you know, let's map whole phrases also into that same vector space that we had uh, single words in. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, so what we would hope is that we could find a model that also learns that you know, the country of my birth and the place where I was born are both syntactically and semantically similar. And if we you know, learn features to represent these phrases, then we could immediately m make those you know, representations useful um, in, in various different downstream tasks. And, and that's sort of what we found also, is that you know, once we could learn automatically a representation like that, we can get state-of-the-art performance on a lot of different tasks very quickly. So that leads us to the question, yeah. Um, arbitrary n grams. So 10 grams, 12 grams, they all will be in the same space. So how should we map phrases into vector space? And uh, this is where the linguistic notion of the compositionality of compositionality comes in. So the principle of compositionality in our case states that the meaning vector of a sentence is determined by one, the meaning, uh, meanings of its words. So here again, we assume that, uh, especially in the beginning, these are vector representations that capture distributional information, contextual uh, you know, word counts. And two, the rules that are used to combine them. So if I have here a possessive determiner my, and I combine it with birth, then I want the resulting vector representation to maybe look more like birth, but have latently, in one of its dimensions, some possessive quality to it now. The country of my birth is a proper noun phrase, of my birth is a preposition phrase, and so uh, to, together this whole thing maps um, to a sentence and then ideally be close to other countries. The neat thing about uh, recursive deep learning algorithms is that they can actually jointly learn these vector representations, which we can use as features for different uh, tasks, and the tree structure in which we're combining them. And I will focus mostly on natural language processing in this talk, but one thing I want to bring across to you is that composition is really everywhere, and it's a very central part of artificial intelligence. If we you know, see this kind of equation, we don't just want to classify, you know, this is this kind of distribution or something, but the way we actually understand it is by decomposing it into its parts and then understanding how these parts are put together and you know, how they form the meaning of the entire equation. Similarly, if we have an image, we don't just want to classify like this is a church, but we want to be able to understand what are the different parts of the scene, how do different you know, parts of objects compose to full objects, and then how do these objects interact in the scene. All right, so the goal um, of this uh, sort of very brief uh, tutorial is to just subsample three projects um, in this uh, domain of recursive deep learning, which basically uh, show you that these models can capture compositional meaning, so how words compose to, uh, mean, you know, to the meaning of longer phrases, jointly learn uh, these tree structures, these parsing structures, feature representations, and language prediction tasks. I will start with parsing, which is in some sense a more technical problem inside natural language processing of trying to understand the grammatical structure of a sentence. It's a very useful first step for analyzing language. 
Um, after that, uh, we can assume that we know the tree structures and then look at some interesting uh, semantic compositionality effects, uh, in this case for sentiment analysis. And then I will show you how, because everything is now in a vector space, we can actually very easily combine um, the meaning uh, that is in language with uh, the visual world. And actually, you know, meaning by itself isn't just purely linguistic. We usually, a lot of the sentences and, and utterances that we have and, and use connect to what we see in the visual world. All right, so let's get started with parsing. Um, who here is familiar with parsing already? All right, so a, a handful of people. So I'll, I'll introduce the task um, a little bit first. So let's assume we have the sentence here, the cat sat on the mat. Uh, what we will want a parsing algorithm to do is to basically understand that the cat is, you know, a proper noun phrase, and those two words combine, and I could co replace, you know, this noun phrase with any other noun phrase and still get a grammatically correct English sentence. The mat is also a proper noun phrase. On the mat is a prepositional phrase, or PP. Sitting on a mat is a verb phrase, and this whole thing is a sentence. So this is the standard parsing task that would give you this kind of discrete tree structure from which you might then have to sort of manually go in and say, oh, maybe if I wanted to extract all the things that are on top of other things, then maybe I should look for, you know, something where you sit and maybe have some regular expressions here and then say like, oh, you know, I you know, want to have a regular expression of sit, sat, and sitting, and then uh, and sits maybe, and then, you know, it goes up to a verb phrase, and then I don't care about this rest, and so on. So a lot of people in traditional natural language processing would then go in use these structures and come up with regular expressions to try to extract some, something that they care about. You know, it could be pathology reports and medical uh, diagnosis um, and, and various other kinds of problems. Uh, um, uh, a lot of finance companies, you know, try to use these kinds of features to extract information about stocks and like, oh, is this rising or falling or is there some negative news about a company and so on. So what we want to do, though, is instead of just having this discrete structure of which we then as humans have to look at and try to extract uh, you know, features from, we want to learn a feature representation already for the words and also for all the phrases in here so that we could then just take this list of numbers, plug that into a classifier, and automatically, um, automatically use it for downstream tasks. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's what the whole talk will be about. Uh, yeah, N nothing was missed yet, no. <laughs> um, so, uh, going to exactly that, how would we actually compute um, these phrase vector representations? Our basic computational unit will be a so-called recursive neural network, um, which basically will have two inputs. In the beginning, it will just be the single word vectors. Um, and again, those will just capture distributional information. We can use uh, methods like PCA to uh, reduce the dimensionality from you know 100,000 uh, dimensional distributional vector to just 50 or so. And um, so the two inputs are basically the two candidate children's representations, initially just words, later on also non-terminal nodes that get piped into this neural network. And then there will be two outputs. Uh, the first output is the semantic representation of these two merged nodes. And the second one, uh, in the case of parsing, will be a score of how plausible it was actually to combine these two vectors. So let's zoom a little bit into this, you know, what this actually means for a neural network and what this would look like. So assuming everything is two dimensions, again, that is just for illustration, technically there will be 50 or 100 dimension, dimensions to capture a lot, a lot more richer information. So assuming here we have a child one and child two of these vectors, what we'll do is just concatenate vectors, so we would now, in the case of 2D, have a four by one dimensional vector here, and then we multiply this by matrix W of parameters. And these parameters is just essentially just a very simple matrix, which in our case would be a two by four matrix, mapping two vectors into the space of uh, a single vector again. And then we add a bias term, that's also a parameter B, and uh, so this one so far was just a linear operation. What we'll then do is we apply a hyperbolic 10H, um, which will essentially squish the values to be between minus one and one. And this might seem like a trivial kind of difference, but this will allow us to have more than just linear interactions between two vectors. Once we have this parent vector here, we'll just have a simple inner product, uh, V transpose P, where V is also again a parameter that we wanna learn. So this is, so far, just a standard neural network. 
how do we actually apply this to compute the uh, representation for the whole sentence? So in uh, the simplest uh, algorithmic search formulation for this, a greedy search, what we'll do is we'll just take you know, the first two words, we pipe them through the network, we get the parent vector, a potential parent vector, and the score out. Then we'll keep doing that for every possible pair of words. And what we'll next do is basically take the one with the highest score and then assume that we just combine these. So we're going to ignore that you know, cat sat was just a very bad combination, but the cat is a very obvious noun phrase, so we'll merge these two next. And now the model has not yet seen if the cat as a phrase would be reasonably combined with the verb sat. And so what we'll do is apply that same neural network again. And this is where the recursion comes in. The output of this neural network becomes the input to that same neural network. So now the cat sat is a pretty, you know, proper uh, phrase, um, so we would assume it gets a higher score, but the mat is an even more obvious noun phrase, so we'll merge those two next, and then again ask the model, you know, how likely would it be to combine on the mat? Is that a proper grammatical phrase in the English language? And, you know, we would assume so, and so we can build this tree structure up in this bottom-up fashion. Yeah. Yes. Yes, this will be supervised. I'll have two slides and then I'll talk about the training. Yeah. Where is the neural network that was trying to modulate that sentence? For the what? The the line and what feature like how do you get such numbers extra numbers? Okay, so so that's maybe you did miss that. So in the very beginning of the talk I mentioned these basically capture distributional information. So assume I take the you know word Germany, I go through a very large corpus like Wikipedia. And I look, uh, you know, at the words, the five words to the left and five words to the right of every occurrence of Germany that I see, and then I, ca you know, basically count up the words that I see in this window. Once I've done that, I have this very large dimensional vector of all the words that appeared locally close to every instance of the word Germany, and then I run principal component analysis or related models um, to just reduce the dimensions um, of that. That's, that's what we do, uh, or some similar models uh, can, can be used for getting the word vectors. Can you do the, what do you do this to get that? So you, you say, king is learning that line one, which means that you have to write that corpus of text in there. So what kind of text is the input to that? Like what documents you have input? Wikipedia. So we use Wikipedia. Pardon? Wikipedia? Yes because it's widely available, it talks about a lot of different things, has pretty broad coverage of words and so on. Say again? Of course not, no, no, I mean if I, if I trained on just a news corpus, yeah, the, the, the specific numbers don't matter, you can you know, rotate the whole space, it doesn't really matter for a lot of downstream tasks. And, uh, this is also with a caveat, and only in this uh, first project we actually have to have this unsupervised, uh, unsupervised training of these word vectors. Um, in the next top part of the talk for some sentiment analysis, we can actually just initialize these word vectors to small random numbers and then train it jointly with the task. Yeah. 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 Do we rely on what order? Um, the temple order of the words? Uh, yeah, in, in some sense we do in that, you know, the tree structure would be quite different if, you know, um, you wouldn't have that exact word order. So the representation that you get up here really depends on the order of the words and it captures sort of the grammatical structure as well as the meaning of each of the words in isolation. The table representation? Yeah, so if you, you know, just, just give a probability of each possible combination of Right, so uh, we'll, we'll get to that in, in two slides also together with the training. Um, so, so what I described so far was the simplest recursive neural network you can think of, which used the same weight matrix 
for all the different compositions. So I have an adverb and an adjective, a verb phrase and a noun and so on. And it com uses the same matrix W to combine all of these different kinds of phrases, which essentially is just not powerful enough. So what we do instead actually is to have a different composition for combining and composing different types of uh, syntactic structures. Correct. So there, in total, there will be around 800 or so different uh, syntactic combinations. So how do we actually train this, and, and where do these, you know, how can, what's the objective function to actually train this model? So the main idea, again, for these, uh, um, you know, different W matrices is that we essentially condition the semantic vector uh, composition function, and in our case, we condition this on the output of a very small state and very fast to compute uh, PCFG or probabilistic context tree grammar. We can then define the score of the full tree as the sum of the local scores, and we train this in this following max margin structure prediction framework, uh, similar to Ben Tasker et al. 2004. Let's walk through this equation uh, in a little bit more detail. So we assume for a given sentence x i, we have the correct tree structure y i. So a couple of linguists set together and defined, uh, you know, what is what is the correct uh, grammar for English for uh, these sentences. And now we look at these scores, and again, these scores are just, you know, inner products we transpose times uh, the vectors at every node that we got as output from the recursive neural network. Um, now, what we're going to do is we're going to maximize the score of the correct tree yi for the sentence xi which is, you know, these are again just the sums. The sums just came, the elements of the sum were just inner product. So we can, you know, it's very simple matrix uh, derivatives to compute these scores. Now what we'll next do is we'll try to find the highest scoring tree over the set of all possible trees A of Xi. And because there are Catalan many, so exponentially many possible binary tree structures, um, this is where the different kinds of search uh, strategies come in. The way I sort of visualized this two slides before was with the greedy approach. You can also, for those of you familiar with this, use the CKY-like beam search. Um, so then once we found uh, the highest scoring tree for the sentence XI, we will then try to minimize that, um, that one, that highest scoring tree Y. And what we'll actually do during the search procedure is uh, with this delta term here, is we'll actually encourage the model to make mistakes. So that while in training, you know, we can correct it more and more often and uh, basically add to every incorrect score, we add a little bonus. And then once it gets the right tree, once Y is exactly YI, these two terms cancel out and there's no more bonus, so this becomes zero and we're done with that sentence. And the, the correct tree will then score up to margin higher to the next uh, highest scoring tree. We'll train this whole thing with backpropagation, which is really just a nice name for taking matrix derivatives. Um, so again, these were just inner products, matrix multiplications uh, interspersed with these nonlinearities, um, and it just falls out of straight up uh, linear algebra. Um, one neat trick um, to, for optimization is an adaptive gradient method here, uh, introduced by John Dushi et al., who uh, modified the following stochastic gradient descent or mini batch stochastic gradient descent method. Um, then the way we update um, each I, the I element of this is by not just taking multiplying the learning rate with the gradient, but also keeping track of all the previous gradients of previous time steps and then squaring those values and summing over that and then taking the square root of that. So what does that actually do in practice? Well, there are certain compositions that we see very rarely in the whole data set. So like sentence fragment, plus a WH word or something. That's not a very common composition. What this will allow us to do is have a very large learning rate and update those parameters with a very large learning rate. And then uh, for the things that we see in almost every sentence, like you know, determiner plus nouns, almost in every sentence, we get a quickly, a uh, much smaller learning rate here for those kinds of parameters and then stop updating that and uh, have better learning dynamics. All right, so how does this actually do? Um, we call this whole thing a compositional vector grammar, or CVG. And uh, if you just have the same rate matrix 
uh, W for every node. Uh, this doesn't produce uh, a state-of-the-art parser, but once you combine it with the syntactic untying where you have different weight matrices W, you actually get a very competitive parser, um, and this is uh, the currently published uh, Stanford Core NLP parser that a lot of people uh, in industry and academia use. Yeah. Um, the, the Berkeley parser here? Um, boy, uh, I think this one was the state splitting one, but I'm not 100% sure. They, they have the state splitting, so they learn uh, sort of a set of discrete representations. So you have like noun phrase one, noun phrase two, noun phrase three, and so on. Um, but yeah, they you know, publish the parser pretty, almost every year. Um, so like, I'm not 100% sure if it's exactly that one. Um, there are actually other more accurate parsers out there um, in the literature, but they take a lot longer to train and are a lot slower at test time. Uh, and they, you know, require more, uh, more data also during the training of the parser. What's actually more exciting to me personally than having another parser out there is what kinds of uh, vectors um, and representations do we learn at the top of the tree um, from this parser. So remember how, you know, every node now has a vector representation and we now have you know, this vector representation for a bunch of different sentences. What we can now do is basically take a bunch of sentences, in this case from the Wall Street Journal, and pick one sentence and then look at the nearest neighbors in this high dimensional space. Um, and and see what see what's being captured in these vectors, and what's cool is that it actually captures exactly what we were hoping, which is syntactic and semantic similarity. So here we have for all the figures are adjusted for seasonal variations. For that sentence, the next nearest neighbors are all the numbers are adjusted for seasonal fluctuations, and the next one is all the figures are adjusted to remove usual seasonal patterns. So we're seeing that you know it captures that these sentences are very similar syntactically, but also capture. Um, similar semantics. Another nice example here is uh, some companies, Nitrator wouldn't comment on the offer. It's very similar to Harsco. Some other company declined to say what country placed the order and Coastal wouldn't disclose the term. So it captures basically that, you know, we have similar kind of, uh, you know, some company names, some negation declining wouldn't and some commenting saying disclosing and so on. So this is essentially what we were hoping to in that uh, toy figure I showed you in the very first slide. What's also cool is that uh, when people have worked on previous parsers, uh, linguists and feature engineers sat down and looked at like, how can we improve you know, from us, from our intelligence, uh, using our intelligence, how can we improve uh, these parsing algorithms? And this is actually a very common theme, I think, in a lot of big data kinds of prediction problems, whereas you have human experts who look at the data and then try to understand what are the features that we could extract to make this a lower dimensional problem and then you know, pipe it into some classifier like a support vector machine or logistic regression or random forest. What's cool is uh, what we actually saw here is that the model learned a soft notion of so-called head words, which you know, experts, uh, natural language processing experts, had also found to be a very important feature. So remember how I described my and birth and how I wanted the resulting vector when I combined my with birth to look a little more like birth and a little less like my? Well, this is exactly the kind of matrix in the resulting vector representation. So this is just one of many examples where a deep learning kind of approach was able to learn features in a you know, richer kind of formulation, not as discrete as, as sort of humans uh, and experts had designed. And, and, and for me, that was actually what makes this kind of very exciting because I feel like it puts artificial back into artificial intelligence, uh, which had sort of become more, you know, Great, like graduate student intelligent and graduate student ascent of like understanding good feature engineering and then plugging it into some weight optimizer in the end. Another interesting aspect that is also we also commonly see in, uh, in deep learning when applied to natural language processing is so-called transfer learning uh, by using these intermediate representations. So here um, are some examples of four sentences that were incorrectly classified by every parser that we looked at largely because the official training data set, the Wall Street Journal, it's mostly about financial news and things like that and doesn't talk about eating spaghetti. So what we then did is we gave um, the 
previous uh, Stanford parser uh, that is basically just seeing words as discrete counts. Um, these two sentences for training and our new compositional vector grammar. So the sentences are he eats spaghetti with a fork and she eats spaghetti with pork. And ideally, if we know the semantics of the words being involved with this, we would realize that he eats spaghetti with a spoon is actually very similar to you know, eating with a fork, because spoon and fork are very similar, and pork and meat here are also very similar. And that's exactly what happens. The original Stanford Factive parser didn't get this right, but the convolutional vector grammar realized that an eat with a spoon is a way, a TPE transitional phrase, that modifies how you eat. So it attaches to the verb phrase. And this is so-called the TP disambiguation problem in NLP. And this is sort of why parsing helps you. It helps you disambiguate and make sense of what's being combined and connected to what. So here, with a spoon, connects to the verb phrase, whereas with meat, correctly attaches to the noun phrase of spaghetti, modifying what kind of spaghetti you're eating. So it was able to basically transfer the knowledge from one example, you know, uh, with fork and with pork, to another example uh, because of semantic similarities. All right. So briefly, um, let's talk about an algorithm that also learns hierarchical structures for images. Actually, the cool thing is I don't need to tell you any new algorithm. Because we didn't do any feature engineering um, for language and made anything particular, any particular assumptions about, you know, this kind of word has to be combined with this, and because I have this, you know, a head word like that, we can use the exact same algorithm to also learn about images. So we assume we have some representation here, not, not, not for words, but for regions, small regions of images, or so-called super pixels very small regions that are very uniform in you know, what they look like. And we're learning as a recursive neural network to combine pieces of objects that are, you know, part of the, yeah, pieces of the image that are part of the same object. Yes? So for a language, Here it is the spatial order. So we're, uh, we make the simplifying assumption to only combine and compose regions that are right next to each other. Yeah, so it's kind of a 2D version of, of language. Yeah? Just to clarify, mm -hmm. those, those three actually have a smaller region, right? Mm -hmm. You don't start from those predefined Yeah, yeah, so like we just have random sort of pieces uh, of the image. Yeah. And they are so-called super pixel algorithms that are very fast to compute. Yeah. All right, so looking at a couple of outputs for that, it actually works surprisingly well. Um, so like you have here, you know, red is classified as building, dark green as grass, right, uh, as, as dark green as trees, bright green as grass. This is the Stanford background data set, so we have, you know, just one foreground object class for uh, motorcycles, people, and cars. We have streets, and so on. Um, and what's neat also is that um, the model essentially outperforms using the exact same input representations for small regions that outperforms other kinds of models that had been used in the computer vision literature a lot, uh, which are based Markov random fields or MRF models or conditional random fields. All right, so this was sort of the more technical part because uh, it's important to understand how we get these tree structures. Now that we have the tree structures, we can do a lot of fun stuff. Uh, so uh, in our case, we'll start with sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is, you know, linguistically and academically a very interesting task, but it's also actually crucial to social media analysis, business intelligence, marketing, lots of companies out there, you know, run marketing campaigns, they want to see if, you know, their company is more positively, um, you know, talked about on Twitter afterwards. Um, there's algorithmic uh, automated stock trading going on, which is actually kind of scary when you think about it. At algorithms, they go in, they, they read text and then make automatic calls to buy or sell a certain stock. You might think that's kind of crazy, especially with current technology, but, and, and obviously these companies are very secretive about whether they're doing that or not, but we actually can see a glimpse of that happening sometimes, and this was an interesting case in 2011, when Anne Hathaway starred in a movie, the movie got really good reviews, and then immediately uh, after the reviews came out and were very positive, the stocks for the company Berkshire Hathaway went up a significant amount. And so it's very clear here that, you know, they saw Hathaway that did incorrect uh, entity disambiguation and then bought a bunch of stocks for that company. And so a lot of people are very confused of why that would happen, but I think, I think this is sort of an interesting glimpse into, into algorithmic trading from the outside world. 
All right, so there is a little bit um, the sentiment in the NLP community that this is an easy task. Um, and I think that's largely because if you, in, you know, a lot of academic data sets looked at very large documents, like movie reviews with a thousand words or so. If you're a review writer and you wanna you know, convey a message, you're not gonna try to be super ambiguous uh, overall, right? You're gonna you know, see a bunch of words like awesome or you know, horrible or boring, and if you see you know, three or four of those words, it becomes fairly clear what overall this document, you know, uh, the document's uh, sentiment is about. However, for uh, shorter uh, sentences or shorter phrases and, and uh, se sentences of full length, um, uh, for instance, of a, a data set from Pang and Lee in 2005, the accuracy has never exceeded above 80% in the last seven or more years. And I think shorter uh, text snippets become more and more important because one, if you want to really carefully understand what that one CEO said in that one article, it's very important also you know, for tweets and, and shorter status updates on Facebook and so on. It's very, it becomes more and more important to really understand what one uh, sentence was about. And what I'm basically arguing is that uh, you, know, you can get, uh, again, to 80%, by just you know, finding the positive words. If you just look at all the words that include, all the sentences that include the word awesome, it's hard, even if something is not awesome, it might still be reasonably okay. So you can get away uh, with a lot of the examples by very simple, like simply counting words. But once you wanna uh, you know, push beyond 80%, which is very easy for, for people, um, then you really have to understand negation and its scope and other semantic effects. So, um, we're not the first to think that, oh, maybe you should use tree structures and grammatical analysis for that. However, uh, all the previous structured prediction models haven't really outperformed simpler bag of words with maybe some bigrams and some extra features uh, on top of them. Um, and that's largely because they tried to be, again, very discreet with their uh, feature representations that they put into these models. They say, oh, if I see the negation word here and I see something, you know, that's you know, in this uh, polarity of sentiment, then I'm just gonna flip it. But it's not really, sentiment isn't that simple. You know, if I say it was not the worst movie, it doesn't mean I flipped the logical you know, switch and now it's a fantastic movie, right? Not the worst movie is still just a mediocre movie. Um, so really what we needed and figured out, and this is also a general uh, lesson um, for deep learning is more supervised data the, once you have uh, above a certain threshold of labeled data, which is getting cheaper and cheaper to collect with Amazon Mechanical Turk and, and Crowdflower and other kinds of uh, crowdsourcing companies, you can very easily collect more data. And once you have enough data, then the algorithm can do a better job uh, than feature engineers. So what we did is we went ahead and for a bunch of sentences, basically parsed the trees and then extracted all the syntactically plausible phrases for the sentences and then ask people to label them. And it's very hard to figure that out. In the new uh, for, um, annotation scheme, we know, okay, like for me to be positive, but it's not like for me, it's actually a negative phrase. And you know, it's not like for me, it's vulgar, it's also very negative. So we basically collected 215,000 phrases um, of the original Pang and Lee, uh, roughly 12,000 sentences. And now we can actually train and test whether we are composing the meaning and the sentiment correctly. Um, what we first notice is basically any model you give more data, it will actually already improve you know, up to 3%. However, what we then found is that the hard negation cases are still mostly incorrect. It's still very easy to fool the model. So we came up with um, a new idea, uh, basically a new kind of recursive model, which we call a recursive neural tensor network. The main idea is instead of having just two vectors and linearly composing them and then applying a nonlinearity, what we want is uh, a multiplicative interaction between these two vectors. So assuming we have the tree structure, assuming we have these word vectors, in this case they're actually just random. So we just uh, randomly initialize the word vectors and we'll train them jointly. And then we go up the tree and keep combining. So here in the first step we would combine the vector B for very and the vector C for good. And the way we'll do this is this with the bilinear form here, so where we would kind of take the two vectors, transpose them, multiply them by a matrix. This is now a 2n by 2n, or in the two-dimensional case, a 4 by 4 matrix. And then we just get a single number out. But of course, we want the resulting parent vector as a you know, list of numbers to be re recursively compatible. So we want to be able to use the same network again at the next higher stage. So what we're going to do is we'll have multiple 
slices of uh, these matrices. And each slice essentially computes one element of the parent vector. And you know, each of these slices allows the two vectors to multiplicatively mul uh, uh, change uh, each other and have interactions. We then add the standard R and N part and apply again an element-wise nonlinearity. We train this uh, just like um, you know, a standard logistic regression classifier by um, looking at um, cross-entropy error at every node for every prediction here and then taking, uh, doing gradient descent on the uh, matrix derivatives. All right. Um, once we, uh, you know, add this new model, we get uh, an even higher accuracy of 85.4. So what used to be below 80% in the last seven years, uh, with you know more data and a better deep learning model, we actually pushed to 85.4. Um, what's more exciting is we can look at, you know, sort of the difference between simpler models that don't take the uh, recursive structure into account and look at not just positive and negative like the original data set, but very negative, negative, neutral, positive, very positive, so five class classification problem. And because we have more annotation, we can look at the accuracy at every different length um, of words. So here we just look at the accuracy, for instance, for all the five uh, phrase, five word phrases. And basically, the new RNTN model upper bounds uh, all the other models in terms of accuracy. Um, because we're running a little short on time, I'll skip this sort of interesting analysis of X but Y structures, where it matters to focus on what comes after the but, and the model does much better. A bunch of interesting negation results. So we looked here at a specific subset of very hard negations, where it's very obvious for humans, but algorithms had a very hard time automatically learning uh, the relationships here. So here we have the sentence, Roger Dodger is one of the most compelling variations on this theme. And it just changed most to least, right? A very small difference to a bag of words representation. It might not be that large of a difference, but the model realizes least compelling is negative, and then that percolates up the tree. We also have, you know, I liked every single minute of this film versus I didn't like a single minute of this film. And, you know, it becomes negative. So we you know, looked at all the positive sentences and their negations and basically saw, okay, the RNTN is you know, almost 50% more accurate than a simpler bigram naive base model, uh, which is actually has outperformed support vector machines and logistic regressions and other kinds of models on, um, on this uh, you know, sentiment analysis task. Um, but basically all the models realized that when you have a positive sentence and you see a negation, things become more negative. The probability distribution here over these five classes changes and it becomes more negative. So then we're worried, well, maybe all this fancy deep learning model learned is I see a negation and I make things more negative. So then we looked at like, well, what happens when you negate an already negative phrase? And basically the model did exactly what we wanted, which is it doesn't actually flip it, but it makes it more neutral and with a slight hint of positive. So we can look at the prediction neutral or slight uh, hint of positive. So it's, you know, and that's exactly what we say, right? It was not bad, if it was trained on, you know, American speakers, then that would be mostly neutral with a slight hint of positive. Maybe if it was, you know, trained on British annotations, it might be a little more positive. So we could see here, um, you know, it's just incredibly dull, it's negative, it's definitely not dull, uh, becomes neutral. And again, the new model is much more accurate, but what's more exciting is, it's actually the only model in the literature that was able to learn this effect from the data. Uh, that basically the probability mass for the neutral and positive classes increases. None of the other models were able to just pick that up from looking at a bunch of examples. Uh, you can actually play around with this model um, on our website, nlp.sanford.eu slash sentiment. It's a very fun, fun demo. Um, and uh, training and testing code uh, is also available. Um, on like from my website uh, and on this website also. All right, in the last couple of minutes, I wanna briefly uh, go over and show you that because everything is learned, we deep learning techniques can learn representations and features for images as well as for language, we can actually combine these two modalities, uh, which I think could be a very exciting new direction, uh, not just for sort of uh, academic tasks, but also in the medical domain where you have, you know, certain uh, scans uh, of people, you have pathology reports, and you want to try to combine the two, map them into a joint space, so you can then query for images and uh, using sentences. So basically what we're going to do is we will map sentences into a vector space and then use uh, so-called convolutional neural networks 
um, to map images into that same vector space. So both sentences and images are living now in the same high dimensional vector space so that we can then actually use a sentence to try to find an image and we train this model such that an image that visualizes a certain sentence gets a very similar vector representation and vice versa. So we can actually, you know, for a given image, find a sentence that describes that image very well. Um, maybe I will skip the details, but basically on the image side, we'll use a convolutional neural network, um, which I can't go into too many details. Uh, it's sort of one of these state-of-the-art uh, neural networks. Actually, nowadays, um, a lot of good libraries out there also that are open source um, for using for training uh, uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, so here's an example of the output. So imagine you give this uh, algorithm the image, uh, you know, this image, it will then have, you know, thousands of sentences to select from and it will actually, the nearest, the four nearest neighbors of, uh, of, you know, that image's vectors are the following four sentences, two of which are correct in this data set. There are five correct sentences, five correct uh, image descriptions, and then, you know, hundreds and thousands uh, of other incorrect sentences. And yeah, basically, you know, the model still makes mistakes, but it actually, you know, is the state of the art model um, on this task. Um, we can um, basically see that it captures a lot the right kinds of, uh, you know, attributes. I hear it's a group of people, even though none of these are correct, because it kind of gets the, the background all wrong, um, but it kind of, you know, realizes that, um, you know, the, the setup at least and, and some of the people. Um, Basically, the model performs really well, and um, this is uh, called a dependency tree, a recursive neural network. All right, let's, let's summarize a little bit and give you a higher level view of, of what was going on here. Basically, um, standard deep learning in the last couple of years has worked very well on fixed length inputs. So you had images, and you know, Google had a lot of amazing results on you know, single words as well as you know, uh, images and learning sort of uh, feature representations and understanding the semantics of, of images that all had exactly the same size. A lot of those techniques couldn't be used for variable length inputs. And so what we basically did here at Stanford is to focus deep learning on ex uh, extending it to variable length inputs and learning representations and learning features automatically as part of the model. Uh, in, in our case, we explored uh, three different model variations, which I think are also very similar to, you know, other kinds of uh, deep learning um, analyses. Uh, basically, we have different objective functions, different composition functions, you know, different types of neural network architectures to compose vectors, and we can have, you know, different kinds of tree structures also. Um, for training objectives, I talked to you uh, today about uh, sort of this max margin prediction framework and uh, the standard cross entropy error for various different classification problems. I gave you the example of sentiment analysis, right, where the prediction problem was classified this as positive or negative. But there's nothing in the model that requires us to, you know, use this only for sentiment. We can just uh, ask it, oh, give me all the named entities in this sentence. Or, you know, you classify whether this sentence is grammatically correct or incorrect, or if this should get a high score if it was in a student essay or not. Any kind of label that you have, you can put on this, and then the model will learn how to represent the words and the phrases to make sense for that prediction task. Um, I showed you uh, the recursive neural tensor networks and the standard RNNs, um, uh, but didn't talk about the matrix vector RNN, which has very interesting linguistic intuitions. Basically, we represent every word uh, as not just a single vector, but also as a vector and a matrix, where, you know, when you have a word like very, you might assume, oh, very doesn't have much of a meaning by itself, but it has a strong operational meaning when I combine it with good, for instance. But basically, the tensor network um, works much better than these. Um, I promised to look at this uh, sentence that I had in the very beginning and show you what, what the model essentially does. Um, this is, you know, this film doesn't care about cleverness, wit, or any other kind of intelligent humor, and it does indeed realize that these are all pretty positive, but once it doesn't care about it, it becomes negative. So this compositional structure um, and capturing that is very central to artificial intelligence, and these recursive neural network techniques can jointly learn compositional structure, the feature representations of the no nodes, and predictions. Um, just in the last couple of years, um, there's been state-of-the-art results for the sentence and scene parsing, sentiment analysis, and this grounded sentence image search. And just to give you 
uh, a brief overview. I have like five more slides before we can go to lunch. Um, we can also do uh, really well on relation classification where you have two words in a sentence and you ask what kind of relationship are these in? Is this like an instrument agent relationship or a content container relationship or in this case uh, a message topic relationship? And again, we can uh, use recursive neural networks to just put a different classifier on top that takes, you know, uh, basically at every node in the tree that dominates the two words we care about and then classify that. Uh, we can also get state of the art in paraphrase detection. So understanding whether, they're two, whether two sentences have the same meaning or not. So imagine you had, you know, a ton of customer emails and you get the same question over and over again and people have to manually answer that email. If you know that those two questions are exactly the same, you already knew how to answer the first one, you can auto automatically then answer a lot of other ones that you've already seen. So uh, paraphrase detection also, you know, uses these vector representations of the trees, uh, pipes them through a neural network um, to get a uh, distinction whether this is, uh, a, you know, this has the same meaning or not. Um, uh, we can also do uh, really well or get state-of-the-art performance on 3D object recognition where again, we, because we're not making specific assumptions about the kinds of features that we use and the feature representations that you know, aren't manually curated, we can just, instead of giving it you know, sentences um, or regions uh, for the scene analysis, we can just give it uh, you know, regions of a 3D image that we could get with the Kinect or so and then uh, pipe that through a neural network architecture also and classify different household objects. And uh, the last one that I'm also very excited about is uh, database completion. Imagine you had a database and instead of having just discrete representations saying this is you know, Francesco Ciccardini, he's just one string in a database. Imagine instead we had a vector representations like the ones I just showed for words for every entity in the database. Now what we can do is we can propagate information into these vectors just like we did with sentiment and then actually reason uh, logically over them. So let's assume for instance Francesco Ciccardini, we didn't know his gender and we didn't know his nationality. But we knew uh, his place of birth, we knew uh, some other guy, Matteo Rosselli, and his location and his nationality. Now because everything is in a vector space and we pushed all the people whose you know, place of birth was in Florence or whose location was in Florence into a certain part of the vector space, we can then query the model and ask it, so do you think this new guy here whose nationality we don't know is also in this? And it, it boils down to become a simple classification problem that these models uh, can also do very well on. All right, um, I, I guess, yeah, uh, thank you and this is the end. <laughs>